invited to go in together, where they were greeted in person by the person they could hear in their head. Um, there was a bit of an introduction, and then at that point she invited everyone um, to head off and gave some directions, and at that point everyone crashed into each other. So everyone actually realised then that they were all listening to different things. And for the most part, it was four groups of 50 moving around the zoo. Um, but in this monster Pro Tools session, we actually created 200 individual tracks, where by the end, each person was given their own directions of where to go in the zoo as the sun was setting. And the content um, was really about the evolution of life on Earth and what it means to be a human being through the lens of animals. Um, and uh, when everyone was kind of on their own by the end, people were asked to think about what the ultimate fate of the universe might be when there's nothing left, um, which was kind of a nearly bleak ending. But at that point, we brought all 200 people together back to the, uh, the panda enclosure where we had a children's choir singing the Flaming Lips, Do You Realize, as the kind of finale for the, for the experience. Um, so that was the starting point of Sandpit, which kind of started with our opus in a, in a weird way. But we were lucky enough that the um, Melbourne Zoo came and saw it. Um, and they were very interested in us recreating the experience permanently after hours every night of the year. Um, so at that point, we kind of panicked <laughs> um, and started to figure out how we might do it. And so to begin with, I went into the zoo for a month on my own. Um, and started to meet some of the keepers, some of the animals, uh, some of the operational staff, some of the tech staff, um, and really got to know the organisation and how a kind of immersive creative experience that was very content driven could uh, work alongside the operational requirements of the organisation. Um, and what I, what I learned very quickly was that um, the Melbourne Zoo is a very dynamic place and that um, there'll be gorillas off exhibit because they're fighting or there'll be a sick giraffe so no one can see it or there's something as simple as there's construction going on so all pathways shut down. Um, so we knew we needed to build a fairly robust system that could respond very quickly to the needs of the zoo. Um, so we ended up creating this experience which was called iAnimal um, that ran for three years at the Melbourne Zoo where this time everyone was given an iPod shuffle, uh, sorry, an iPod touch, um, which was synced to a server, so we didn't need everyone kind of pressing play at the same time. Um, and it was a very kind of similar, fairly emotional experience that guided 18 to 40 year olds through the zoo after hours in a kind of magic hour when the sun's nearly setting, which is great. Um, <clears throat> there's very little, little interactivity on the device itself. Um, because you're in this highly visual environment, um, we were thinking, well, why would you want someone wandering around looking at a device mediating your experience? Mm. So we actually created four continuous hours of really immersive composition um, and uh, a whole bunch of experiences that happened um, with a whole set of animals on four different tours with a similar setup that brought everyone back together at the end, where you could have a ride on the carousel. Um, but um, at various points too, if there was an animal off exhibit that the audio referred to, at the drop of a hat, the zoo could replace that content with video content um, that referred to something else, so they were always kind of safe. Um, the great thing about this too was kind of visitor matrix um, that we were receiving as well. Um, this is another technique that we use a lot that we've stolen from a very badly named theatre company in the UK called Roto Zaza, um, who invented a technique called Auto Teatro that we've used a lot, which basically means um, you uh, give someone very basic physical instructions and then someone else watching them hears some information based on that physical gesture. Um, so here we've got one line of the audience describing to the other line that you can kind of see on the slide there um, about a particularly well-endowed gorilla. Um, uh, but this is a great technique because it means we don't have to employ actors. We can get, uh, we can get the audience to actually participate themselves to help the um, stories. At the at various points too uh, in the experience you are invited to kind of write your name or draw a quick picture on the iPod Touch um, and then at the end sucks all of those contributions into a hand-drawn artwork um, and there were four different ones that were themed with the four different tools um, and you're shown that artwork on your screen and then if you put in your email address you can download it um, as a PDF, print it, stick it on your fridge or share it on Facebook or Twitter. Um, this has been really powerful um, for the zoo um, because we did embed some conservation messages in there as well um, but also it means that they were getting a really high uptake on people putting their email addresses in and signing them up to their um, um, so I'm racing through this stuff here, there's a lot to get through, but um, from there we went uh, on to work with Penguin Books, um, who came to us um, and said, um, the, 
the brief was the bookstore of the future. Um, so we kind of sat with that for a while and uh, had a whole bunch of ideas and a lot of them were kind of, you know, we'd have a kind of wooden surface that we're projection mapping a book on and you blah, 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 and it was all kind of a bit boring. Um, so we threw a bunch of ideas at them and then one of the last ones we just kind of chucked in to see how it would go um, was this project called Dial Story where we custom built this kind of very nostalgic looking public payphone with Dial Story in a big light box at the top. Um, but if you pick up the receiver, John Safran is the uh, operator on the other end, and he says to you, I've got a whole bunch of Penguin's authors that would like to share a story with you, and you can dial in which story, uh, which author you'd like to hear. Um, and Penguin were really generous in it. They, they gave us a day, well, half day, with um, a whole bunch of their authors like John and Father Bob and Maggie Beer and Colette Dinigan, uh, Graham Bass a bunch of others, um, where they could share a story with us that you wouldn't get from one of their books. Um, so we really wanted this to be kind of very special, kind of intimate experience that felt like you were directly connecting with the author. Um, at, uh, so they share a little story with you, and then they say, after the beep, I'd like you to share a story back. Um, so there's a beep, and you're invited to share a story back from your own life. If you hang up, uh, it prints out a little ticket through one of these uh, slits here that's got a unique ID and a URL. Uh, and if you visit the website and punch in uh, your unique ID, you can hear a recording of your story that you left back and leave a message on Facebook, or, and sort of share it on Facebook or Twitter. Um, but also you hear an archive of all the other stories that have been left there as well. So this is a project that ran for a couple of years as well and um, traveled to libraries, airports, bookstores around the country. Um, there were two of them that we made. Um, one of the kind of big design mistakes was really over-engineering it. Um, it. It's bomb-proof to hell, um, <laughs> to the point where it's on a metal plate that's about that thick that's pretty impossible to pick up. Um, so that's one thing I'd do differently next time. Um, but what's been really fascinating from kind of a user experience perspective is the fact that it's a computer. Um, so sitting behind that keypad is a Raspberry Pi, um, but um, even with elderly people there's no explanation they need to use this particular computer. Um, everyone knows that you approach a phone, you pick up the receiver, and you start pushing buttons. Um, so that was one of the really fascinating things for the project, as well as the fact that when we installed it here at the library at the dock in the Docklands, um, uh, we had a really great location for it. It was really public, like this is excellent, people are gonna leave lots of messages. Um, we had a moderation queue that I was listening to, um, and we got very few messages to begin with which was interesting. So the next day we moved it to a slightly more intimate spot and we got a massively bigger uptake. So um, what we learned there was that if people are sharing something from their own life, um, it seems obvious now, they want some privacy to do it in. Um, I was actually talking about this project recently and the woman in this photo here was in the audience <laughs> kind of three years on. <laughs> um, so it was, it, Particularly with that project, and there's been a lot since, but I, I talked to that project a lot because um, because it involves kind of a, a digital technology with a kind of nostalgic, highly tactile interface um, and something you can take home. And that's something that we, we do a lot as well. That um, it, We find with um, people that use our projects that just giving them, even if it's something really simple, it's just of huge value to them. Um, so this is a, a project that we worked on about a year and a half ago now, um, which came from a brief from the state government of South Australia. Um, the brief was um, to build an interactive exhibition celebrating the history of democracy in South Australia. <laughs> That's the most boring thing you could ever think of. So, um, so we thought long and hard and we're like, okay, how can we make this a kind of interesting and interactive in a way that's meaningful? So we thought, wouldn't it be great if we could use the process of democracy to educate people about democracy? Um, so when you enter the exhibition, there's a big wooden plinth that's made in a similar material as this. So this is all under construction in this photo too. You can see someone working on it. Um, there's a big wooden plinth, um, and we work with this really great sign writer, um, like a very traditional sign writer, who uh, wrote on the plinth, um, push to enroll. And there's a huge wooden button that's about that big, and you push the button and it spits out a card that just says vote. And from there you enter the exhibition and on this huge screen at the top um, there's animations of historical plebiscites, referenda and parliamentary votes that happened in South Australia, um, giving you the arguments for and against and then this, this screen changes to black and just says vote. 
Um, at that point, you can approach any one of these voting booths, and there's a uh, red circle and a blue circle that are backlit with LEDs. Um, and if you tap your card um, to either of the circles, you can cast your vote. So we're obviously color coding the way you vote. So there's an NFC reader in each of the circles and an NFC tag sitting in the card. Um, this was kind of one of our first forays into, was it our first? Maybe our second foray into NFC, which is something that we continue to use and will continue with um, for the foreseeable future, just because it's, it's such a great technology in that uh, it's cheap. Um, you can hide an NFC tag in nearly anything, <laughs> um, a flat object, a two-dimensional object, um, and the, the same goes with a reader as well. And I'll show you some more examples of stuff we're doing with NFC. Um, also, the, the similar strategy with this as well, that there's a unique ID and a URL on the card. And when you go home, particularly for school, school groups, this is great, um, you can see uh, all of the stuff you voted on, how you voted, um, and some more historical information. I should mention as well that the, the system, as you vote, um, adds up the votes in the room in real time. So you can see all the votes coming in, and then you see the historical vote compared to the vote in the room here and now. Um, so that's still running in South Australia now. Um, this one's a bit of a kind of sidestep. Um, one of our biggest clients is uh, Google's Creative Lab, who are up in Sydney. Um, and on the surface level, their job is to kind of take Google's technology and to do cool stuff with it. Um, they're secretly a part of the, the marketing department. <laughs> But um, they've actually got a fairly altruistic motive going on as well, um, particularly coming from T, um, T Uglo, who's the creative director there, who's really about going, what's the worst case scenario with a lot of this technology and how can we find other ways to kind of circumvent that? Um, so at Google at the moment, um, it's more so a couple of years ago when we did this project, but um, Daydream was a kind of a big push. Um, VR was um, very much on the horizon for them. Um, and and this provocation really came from T going that, that it's really problematic, particularly in um, the kind of environments that we work in, that VR kind of really can shut people off, that it's a very solo experience um, that uh, isn't communal in any way. So what can we do to, to find some other ways around that? Um, so we created this project called Ghost Toast and the Things Unsaid, um, which was a, a project that we ran in Adelaide for a couple of weeks, um, where you arrived at a space and you were given a ghost sheet. Um, so these people are the audience members. Um, and you place a ghost sheet on your head and there's my holes in it. Um, and you kind of get thrown into this room um, and you stand in the middle and there's some performers surrounding you. And you realize very quickly that um, based on your physical orientation, you can hear the inner thoughts of who you choose to look at. Um, so using VR tech, but only sound, um, and using your own eyes. Each of the performers had an in-ear um, earpiece as well, so they could um, be in sync with the inner thoughts that you were hearing if you chose to look at them. Um, the reason we did that too is that um, we kind of we tried it out, and we, we we found very quickly that if you're hearing someone's inner thoughts and you look at them, and they're not really doing anything that relates to that inner thought, it doesn't really work. So you know when you're thinking about something and. You know, if you're like telling yourself off about something, you kind of do that. So, but we kind of made all of those actions in sync with the stuff that you were hearing as one of the ghosts. Um, but it's kind of nice too because you know people put on these ghost sheets and didn't realise there was any technology hidden in it at all until they were put into the room. Um, this was the um, the security cam um, footage for the uh, stage manager that was running the whole thing. Um, so this project was the combination of um, a fund that we received from the Australia Council, which is the Federal Arts Funding Body. Um, they created a fund called the Digital Theatre Initiative that was about picking up new and emerging forms of technology and thinking about how they might apply to live arts in various ways. Um, and one of the biggest fields of inquiry there was looking at when digital kills liveness. Um, which we've experienced in lots of different ways where, I mean, VR is just kind of one of it where, you know, you kind of disappear into your own world. But how can digital kind of um, prevent you from physically connecting with a real human? Um, so re we really wanted to continue our, um, our process with uh, audio tours, which we've done a lot of in the past um, with the zoo projects. Um, but all of the performers that you'd see in them were actually mute. 
So they had in, in ears so they could hear what was going on, but um, all the, the content that the audience was hearing was all pre-recorded. Um, so we really wanted to give voice to the performer. Um, so we were looking for a device um, that could receive uh, radio frequency, um, but also have um, locally stored sound effects and composition that could be triggered over Wi-Fi. Um, we realized very quickly that that didn't exist, so we built our own. Um, this is an early prototype of a little device that we built. Um, and we created this audio tour that was an immersive experience uh, about the apocalypse. Um, and the way we did it, it's actually touring regionally in Australia at the moment, but this performer, Matt, um, takes you through this kind of cruddy environment and refers to the apocalypse, and you can hear it, but you never see it. Um, uh, and he's wearing a radio mic as well, so he, you can hear his voice intermixed with spot effects, so there's like a, an explosion, a few explosions happen at various points, so he ducks right in time for it. Or at this point as well, there's um, uh, a lot of uh, composition that's going on. Um, the flare came about because, as I said, this is an experience that refers to the apocalypse, but you never see it. And we made it, and then when actually it's kind of underwhelming, so let's let off a flare at the end. <laughs> Other um, what we didn't use that the devices are actually capable of, though, um, is beacons. Um, so we can trigger uh, we can trigger sound um, sound effects from particular beacons that we can throw around. And the idea, the reason we did that was for durability, that we could just chuck a whole bunch of beacons around the environment, and then the sounds would trigger. Um, in our experience, beacons are kind of great for a kind of on-off binary state. So kind of really granular resolution, they're not that, that useful. Um, we had great ideas of you know, Matt leading you to a stream and as you get just on top of it, you hear the stream and you have to kind of jump over it. Um, but that didn't really work with the beacon, so we had to trigger that over Wi-Fi. Um, and sorry, the Wi-Fi triggering happening, uh, this guy is a stage manager who's got a button um, hidden on his little bag there that can trigger the devices. I'm going to skip that one, actually. Um, so this is another fray into NFC, which was a project that uh, was live last year called The Story of Lamp. How am I going for time, Lizzie? Great. Awesome. <laughs> I'm speaking really fast. Um, so this is a project that happened last year at the Art Centre um, here in Melbourne. Um, and they approached us, their family and children's pro programming department approached us um, they, they kind of identified a problem, um, and they feel this across the organisation, that um, people in Melbourne view the Arts Centre as an elitist space, and it is when you go there. It's all kind of gold and red velvet and opera and this air curtain that blows you back as you're trying to walk through the front door. So it's not a very kind of approachable space. One of the little known things about the Arts Centre, though, is that there's quite an amazing permanent artwork collection. There. So there's this, it's a civic building that's open all day. Every day it goes down three levels um, and there's big uh, artworks that were commissioned for the building um, by major kind of male <laughs> granted 20th century Australian artists like Fred Williams, Roger Kemp um, that are there for you to see. Um, but no one does because you feel like a security guard's going to come and tell you off. Um, <clears throat> so they got us in um, for a week to scope it out to figure out what we might do. And they wrote a contract for us saying that um, we will design a locative app that guides people around the building. And we knew very quickly that that's not what we wanted to do. Um, so we spent a week there kind of immersing ourselves in the organisation, um, meeting a lot of the staff, um, wandering around. Um, a big stipulation of the project that we were to come up with as well was that it couldn't be manned by staff. That had people come in in the past that were like, oh, it's great, we'll do a back of house tour and you can go under the stage and all of that stuff, but that means someone from the art centre has to kind of follow you along, which is really expensive um, a lot of the time to, to have an additional person uh, on staff. Uh, so it was this, the second day of the scope, I think, that I was walking down one of the corridors um, uh, of the art centre and realised that there's exactly the same. Uh, brass lamp with a red velvet lampshade on repeat about 400 times through the building. Um, and the moment you realise it's this slight kind of David Lynch moment, you can go to the they're following me. Um, so we went, wouldn't it be great if the lamp came to life? So There's a little video that we made. Hear that sound? I've lost sound. Is 
do that in your own. to tell you. Oh, I must warn you now that at the end of this particular story, there will be a monster. A, a terrible, horrible, awful monster. Um, so the Story of Lamp uh, ran last year at the Arts Centre. It's going to come back this year. Um, and it's for kids and families. Um, and you arrive at the box office and you get given a book, a physical printed book, I should have bought one but I didn't, um, called The Story of Lamp and we worked with a local illustrator, Nick Lewis, to make the books. Um, and you open it up and uh, it gives you a little hand-drawn map that takes you to your first lamp um, and it instructs you to tap the book to the lamp. Again, inside the back of the book there's an NFC tag. If you tap the book to the lamp, she comes to life and starts to talk. Um, the lamps are actually heritage listed, um, <laughs> so another stipulation was that the only thing that we could do to them was to remove the light bulb. So um, we built the whole system to be housed and powered by the bayonet of the light bulb. Um, and uh, we removed the light bulb and had LEDs instead, so the intensity, as you saw, of the light goes along with her voice. But also she tells a whole bunch of stories, like uh, she tells the story of a forest and the light starts to go green, or she tells the story of a thunderstorm that goes blue and goes green. Um, and the speaker's in the book? The speaker's in the lamp. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the, the, the story no, is that lamp um, used to be a light um, in the theatre. Um, and one day in rehearsals, she heard this horrible, awful noise. And she's never been back in since. And once you get to the end of the experience, you realise that um, the noise she heard was actually the applause of the audience. So if you clap her today, she can go back into the theatre and enjoy her life again. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, we, I mean, we realised that this is, but we did a lot of testing with kids um, as we made it, and we realised that having a kid sitting next to this lamp wore pretty thin in the end, that it's really just a speaker coming out of a, a lamp. So a lot of the activities, um, there were a lot of activities in it that involved them doing different actions. Um, this is him being a spotlight, kind of chasing one of the performers around on the stage, which is really hard. This is kind of an auto teatro thing that I was talking about before, but using a verbal expression to make that, to get someone to make that shape reliably 100% of the time was really hard. <laughs> I was running around at Acme with all sorts of directions like uh, make, the shape of, or it, make the shape of some binoculars, now put one on top of the other or something. In the end we found like very simple language to get it, but it's always a challenge with that stuff. And that's what the book looks like. Inside. Um, and this is kind of nice too because working with Nick as the illustrator, he's got this really great kind of wonky style. Um, he's actually got a zine called Turd Circus that's in this style as well. Um, but just using that style I think actually ramps up the surprise of there being technology involved in this experience at all. So it's actually kind of a, a bit of a trick that we use a bit. To, and you saw it a bit in the democracy machine as well to use like a sign writer and a carpenter who worked on that as well to actually hide the technology inside of it. Um, Again, there's a post experience where you can um, punch in a code on the back of your book and see a record of all the lamps that you visited during your experience and your trip to the art centre. Um, so that brings us to Wonderland, which is um, uh, currently underway at ACME, uh, the Australian Centre for the Moving Image at Fed Square. Um, Wonderland is a exhibition, a large exhibition. It's a um, Melbourne Winter Masterpiece. Um, that will go on to tour internationally after November. Um, that takes visitors uh, through the narrative of Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, but also uh, through the history and evolution of um, special effects in the moving image. Um, and uh, I was approached by ACNE very early on in the process and was speaking to one of their curators on the project and said, what's the, what's the demographic for the show? And she said, it's for kids. 
and people on drugs. <laughs> I said, count me in. Um, and if you go, it, it actually really is <laughs> that, that quite successful in that. Um, but they, um, they were really interested in us creating a layer, a kind of narrative layer that would guide people through the experience. And they'd come to see the story of Lamp as well, and kind of went, how can we evolve that idea a bit further. Um, so we took a bit of inspiration from the Ghibli Museum, which is in Tokyo. I don't know if any, has anyone been there? It's, um, it's excellent. So um, Studio Ghibli uh, films, it's a kind of, you have a kind of immersive exhibition museum that's dedicated to their work. But when you, when you get uh, your ticket um, embedded, inside of your ticket is um, three cells of 35 mil from one of their films. And they tell you when you enter the, um, the museum that somewhere hidden is a projector. And if you put your ticket inside the projector, you'll see your slides, your um, yourselves projected on a wall. And so it's a really simple, just joyful interaction that's just that. Um, but people went nuts for it. And um, when I always hear people like elbowing each other out of the way to get into this projector to do it. Um, so yeah, we were kind of really interested in doing that because the, the exhibition itself is this cornucopia of stuff and light and sound and so much stuff going on. So you know, if we were to build this whole other extravaganza to sit on top of that, just wasn't going to fly. Um, so we ended up creating. So this is a bit of a low res image. Um, we ended up creating four individual maps that were based around four different characters from Wonderland. Um, so there's one for the Mad Hatter, the Cheshire Cat, the White Rabbit, and the Queen of Hearts. Um, they're all geared towards different audience groups. So uh, the white rabbit on one end of the spectrum is for kids. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, the Mad Hatter is kind of the racy <laughs> version of Wonderland. Um, and you open up the map and they're all radically different. Uh, we work with Nick again to illustrate these. Um, uh, but you open it up and you see this kind of continent that is Wonderland. Each country on the continent represents a room in the exhibition. Um, and it's all full of text that guides you through the exhibition and asks you to seek out little things that you might not notice. Um, we avoided any projections or video or moving image. It's all mainly physical artifacts. Um, just because a moving image tends to kind of pure itself, people are really attracted to glowing lights. Um, so a lot of it is looking at some of the puppets from the, um, the original films and some of the original etchings and flip little details in around them that are, um, that are really um, suited to the different audience types of the four maps. So the, the white rabbit, for example, gives um, people very clear, um, fun things to seek out. They ask you to kind of hop between every location and stuff to kind of get kids having more fun. Um, uh, so when you arrive um, in Wonderland, I hope I'm not giving too much away if anyone hasn't been, um, but uh, this is a render. Um, you arrive into Lewis Carroll's drawing room. Um, and sitting on top of this desk is this really beautiful wooden kind of porthole uh, frame with the screen sitting behind it and there's a visitor services officer there who selects a map for you places the map down and then the little round screen reveals which character you are it's a very simple animation of one of the original Tennille etchings which are out of copyright use it um, and that's the first kind of delightful moment for visitors that they then understand which character their their journey through Wonderland is going to be mediated through um, slightly less resi images um, on the inside of the map, um, and again, this is different on every map as well, there's a rebus from Lewis Carroll, um, uh, where words are replaced with symbols. Um, there is um, a secret to the map. That's, right, that's actually all I can say. There's a, there's a secret that you can find in the exhibition. Um, and really, a, a whole bunch of this was um, rewarding people's curiosity, which was kind of the mission for it as well, which kids are responding to really well. And a few people have solved the riddle. Right? Um, sorry, that's awful. <laughs> Look hard. Um, uh, yeah, so it's kind of your, your guide to the exhibition in a very analog way. Um, that's the exhibition layout itself, going from Lewis Carroll's drawing room here to uh, the hallway of doors, the pool of tears, um, the looking glass house, uh, white rabbit's house, uh, caterpillar, Mad Tea Party, Queen's Croquet Ground, the trial, and then you're out. Um, so it's a fairly linear experience through the exhibition as well. On the back of the map um, is this shape. Um, and when you meet the visitor services officer at the beginning, and when they tell you which character you are, they point to that little uh, symbol on the top where you can see the bottom half of Alice. 
um, and ask you to, within the exhibition, to complete Alice, to seek out moments where you can complete her. Um, when you do that, um, so this video is not great, but you place your map down. Ah, didn't work before. I'll show you, people can see on my computer. <laughs> um, basically, you place your map down on a plinth and it triggers a projection. Um, to happen on your map, which is different for every map type as well. So if you're the white rabbit, the white rabbit goes running around in your map. If you're the Cheshire cat, you see the Cheshire cat. Um, and this is really taking a, a leaf, there it is, a leaf out of um, the book from the, um, the Ghibli Museum as well, that that's a very kind of instantaneous, um, delightful experience that's not going to queue, cause um, huge bottlenecks of people queuing up. Um, in fact, Melissa, who was the project manager on it, when we were testing, said, we've really succeeded in this if people kind of put it down and go, huh, and then walk off, <laughs> which is what, what they do. <laughs> like, yes. Um, uh, also, um, at near the end of the exhibition, um, back on that shape, um, this card shape on the back of the map, that's been projection mapped onto for the whole thing. Um, you come into the Queen's Croquet Ground and you're given a bunch of stickers and you're asked to create a collage on the back of the, the card, on the back of your map. Um, and again, they're kind of a whole bunch of images that I cut up from the Tenille uh, etchings. Um, and you create your own design on the map um, and then you go to one of two stations where there's kind of a face hole and a slot. And if you place your map into the slot, it makes a scan of your card and then takes a photo of your face and then creates a, um, a card soldier that moves around painting the roses red. Um, that's me and a friend going to... Um, uh, that's near the end of the exhibition. Um, then once you're out, you notice down here that once again there's, unique, there's a unique ID um, and a URL that's somewhere in there. Um, and if you visit the website and punch in your unique ID, um, you get a take-home version of the card that you created with the hope for acne that that will be shared on social media. Um, also um, on the website as well, and we do, we do this most times as well, is we really build the websites for deep divers, for people that are really interested in the really granular information. Um, so there's a lot of kind of um, links off to different places. There's a lot of um, additional video content. Um, so it's really for Wonderland fans that this stuff's built for. That said, we're getting a really high uptake of this, and what we find is that it's, it's this stuff that really drives that, that if you've got some sort of um, gift that's promised to you, you're more likely to make a visit. Um, so the, um, this kind of brings me back to the beginning as well. The next thing for us, again, um, with ACME, is the renewal project. Um, so ACME has received 40, uh, 44 million from the state government um, to shut down in March next year um, and to um, completely rebuild. So from March next year, we're gutting the building um, and redesigning the entire visitor experience, including the permanent exhibition. I was saying to Lizzie before that um, the uh, it, there's a section in the permanent exhibition that says the future and there's an iPhone 3. <laughs> um, so it's in dire need. Um, so we're, we're working on the experience design for the building, um, which is highly unusual as well that um, contractually we're, um, uh, we're defining the experience principles that will then be adhered to by the architects. Usually it kind of goes around the other way where there's kind of a white box built and it's put an exhibition in there. But actually we're designing a whole bunch of experiences and more strategic overlying principles for the way people navigate the building that will happen whether you come in from Flinders Street level or from Fed Square or see a movie. Um, there's very little I can actually share with you about what that's going to be, but um, <laughs> watch this space. I think it's really going to put Acme on the map. Um, and. Um, a lot of that's really been driven by Seb Chan, who's the Chief Experience Officer, who was at Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian in New York previously, who completely changed that organisation um, and really put visitors and audiences at the centre of what they were doing. So watch this space, but a very similar thing is happening with um, And that kind of brings us vaguely up to date with what we're up to. Um, Lizzie showed me a whole bunch of sound stuff that's happening in here as well, where um, 
we've just started working on two new projects with Google um, that again are embargoed at the moment, but I would love to bring them in there once we've got a prototype to show you guys as well, because I think it would be of a lot of interest what we're doing in that space. Um, sorry, I'm just kind of dangling a lot of carrots there. <laughs> um, that's kind of it. Thanks. Yeah, so, so the question was, you know, is there, is there scope for creating, with what we do, if I've got this right, in, in creating more intimate kind of one-on-one -on -one experiences? Is that or of, outside of public spaces? Yeah, um, so that's something we definitely do a lot with the lab, and some of these new experiences are definitely, you're actually right on the money with one of those. Um, but um, the, the question with this stuff is always scalability. So things like ghost hosts and the things unsaid, the two ghosts at a time, we ran that for two weeks and 180 people saw it, something like that. We had, had a pretty big investment from Google as well. So they're very lucky in that their, their real out outputs of the YouTube videos that are made out of it, that they then spread around the world going, look what we did, rather than come and do it. So it's far and few between that we get the opportunity, a funded opportunity to make something that's you know, for a small amount of people. Um, the story of LAMP was kind of that, although we were packing a lot of people through every day by the end of it. But yeah, I think we've obviously got a lot of kind of passion for intimate experiences, but finding it's always dealing with the pressure of, of putting that in a way that is scalable and a lot of people can experience it. So it's value for money for whoever's building it. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Hey. Uh, great stuff. Thank you. Um, I'm curious about, you were talking about sort of your design process yeah. in a way, and you kind of referred to that kind of immersion that, that is involved yeah. in that, especially when you're, in a sense, almost defining what that project yeah. brief might be, yeah. you know, just responding. Yeah. So when you were saying like, you know, you know a, week, a week of kind of immersive design, yeah. do you have like any sort of guiding, I don't know, method? Do yeah. You, do you kind of, in a sense, set yourself some kind of process yeah, we to do. kind of guide that immersion. We do, and I'm sorry I didn't go into that too much, but I mean the, the reality there is that we have to be fairly nimble, avoiding the word agile, mm. <laughs> and we're fairly nimble in the way we um, have to approach it because it's, it's a fairly vast range of clients, and even, I mean largely we're working with museums and galleries now, but even them have got a lot of difference between what kind of budgets they have access to, um, you know, what their internal processes are, so we have to be fairly flexible with, with how we interact. But ideally, yes, we'd go into an environment, we'd immerse ourselves to begin with. We've usually got at least four prototypes that we'd work through um, once the idea's been signed off on. Um, we'd flex within that based on what the prototypes teach us of how we can, we can change things. Um, the, I mean, again, Google's a really great one for that because we're, we're kind of deep in kind of prototype one at the moment. It's a really simple minimum lovable product that we're striving towards that um, my instincts already are saying that it will change rapidly what the outcome is going to be or massively. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the kind of general process that's kind of immersion, definition, at least four prototypes um, that take us through to an outcome, but with a lot of flexibility within that. I hate, you know, you, you look at our website and there's this kind of methodology there, but the reality is that it, it needs flexibility. You know? And sometimes we receive a brief, yeah. you know, and we build it. So maybe me just follow on from that question a bit. Um, I mean, obviously your theatre background shines through in all of the <laughs> work that you showed, but I'm sort of curious about the, the group. You said there's nine people who work yep. in total. What's the group dynamic? Is everyone from the same background? No. Is so, it of so my background is actually originally film direction. Right. Um, so I, Sam, my collaborator, originally in Adelaide, um, and I both went to Flinders University to do our undergrad, um, uh, where we studied directing. I moved to Melbourne and started a production company and we were making kind of TV commercials and um, 
music videos and short films or some things. Um, then it started to move into interactive, um, and Sam was running a theatre company in Adelaide called The Border Project, who were, their kind of mission was to um, kind of invent new technologies that um, could work with live performance. So this is before um, iPhones happened. Um, we made a show, I'd always go back and work with them in various capacities, but. Uh, we made a show called Travel on Planet Earth where you arrived at the theatre and everyone got a white brick and if you held it that way it glowed blue, that way green and that way red and an accelerometer in it. And they were all mesh networked and at various points in the show the performance would stop and ask the audience which way they wanted the show to go so everyone would vote. And I think, I think they learnt and rehearsed something like 30 hours of material but only performed 15 <laughs> or something across the season. Um, but yeah, that was kind of their mission, um, and so I was collaborating with them a lot, which is where the commission for the zoo happened. Um, but Sam and I were kind of doing it on our own to begin with, um, and bringing in um, subcontractors to build a lot of the stuff. Um, but since then, we've evolved. We've got a third director now, Robin, who's operations. Uh, Sam and I function as creative directors um, in Melbourne and Adelaide, respectively. Um, we also have a project manager, a producer, a uh, software dev, back-end dev, hardware engineer, um, occasional front-end dev, Melbourne producer, <laughs> and UX designer. Um, that's eight, I'm still forgetting someone. someone else. Um, but that's kind of the core team, um, which is fairly ag agnostic with what we can do. We've done that deliberately, just going, you know, if we'd employed a whole bunch of WordPress developers, we're going to be making WordPress sites for the rest of our lives. So, um, yeah, we've got a pretty great team. Um, they're mainly based in Adelaide, which is where production happens. We've got a relationship with the state government where we have access to their Tonsley site, which is a big kind of um, you know, fab lab on steroids that's for commercialization, largely. Um, but yeah, we tend to plug in what we call artisans for, for different projects as well, like the, the sign writer or the carpenter, or sometimes we need a singer or an illustrator or... Um, and that's, to be honest, that's one of the reasons that Google keep coming back to us as well as the networks that we have access to, you know, um, just a common language with different artists who can make stuff. Because we've got a lot of students here, can you just talk briefly about, if, for people that you do want to employ, what do you look for in the people that you employ? Um, the, an interesting one, so Joshua, who's our UX designer back in Adelaide, um, uh, we, he came in very quickly because we, we need a lot of grunt work done. And I happened to be in Adelaide at the time, and he came in and he kind of showed me his folio, and it was like, yeah, yeah, I've done websites, I can do some After Effects stuff. And, so, and I was like, sure, it's what we need. And then I was, I was like, is that it? He was like, oh, I do some comics as well. And he, he showed me this incredible comic book illustration. I was like, yes. <laughs> so, um, uh, our new producer in Melbourne, Angelica, is um, actually a really great composer and um, sound designer as well. So some of the Google projects she's going to be working on in that capacity as well. So. Um, yeah, I really look for, I mean, I mean a really common one is designers that are always also photographers as well that we come across a lot, but yeah, I really look for kooky skills that can challenge my creative thinking as well and to feed into it in different ways. Um, that's the biggest thing. You know, Jeffrey Shaw's interactive media kind of take, okay, well, he, he kind of um, had worked with uh, cinemas with Choose Your Own Adventure and everybody got their own little keypad right. and then reduced his rig to one driver right. and I've been really interested in emerging um, active space screening environments and I said why aren't there more drivers and he said simply the story gets shit yeah. so I'm wondering what kind of experience you've had of um, mobilising, activating people where the outcomes of their interactivity are large scale and yeah. not so intimate, and how you control how that plays out. It's kind of funny, like even these very intimate experiences are so intricate in the way that, so the the ghosts one, so you're, you're standing in the middle of the space, you're one of two ghosts, there are three men and three women who are the performers who are surrounding you. Mm -hmm. um, what you realise eventually is that it's the same couple in three different time zones in the 60s, the 80s and the late 90s. Um, and your kind of mission is to deconstruct what went wrong with this relationship. 
Um, so if you're one ghost, you're just hearing his thoughts, and if you're the other ghost, you're hearing her thoughts. Mm -hmm. Also, what we realised very quickly, the performers occasionally say things out loud, so it's not always internally, like very occasionally. But what I found was that if someone said something, and I was look if someone said something out loud, and I was looking at someone listening to their inner thoughts, it was this awful clunk yeah. that you just couldn't reconcile. It's hearing something live and pre-recorded at the same time. Mm -hmm. So. Um, also, what we wanted to do was to make sure if I went from him in the 50s to him in the 80s, sorry, him from in the 60s to him in the 80s, there was some sort of conceptual bearing on what they were thinking that was related mm -hmm. <laughs> as well. Um, so it wasn't kind of this huge clunk, not only in time, but also in content. Yeah. Um, so when you see the script that we wrote, it was these six columns that ran uh, this huge toilet roll that was like the length of this room, um, where there were gaps in the text if someone said something live that needed to happen and also kind of little flags that describe what content was going on so we knew all of that was synced up. Um, then we had to kind of record it all and then um, in Pro Tools make sure that there were gaps properly for an, an, you know, for this 12 minute experience that you do you know, in this tiny little space. So leverage score. Yeah, it really, it really is. It nearly killed us <laughs> as well, you know. Um, and it is like, that what, what I always try to look for is kind of the elegance of an idea mm -hmm. as well. And it's like, I track that. To be honest, like a track we fall into a lot is just kind of really complicated stuff because it just kind of ends up falling that way. So it's kind of a rambling answer to your question. But it's, you know, the, there's extreme complexity in very basic things and there's extreme basicness in very big things <laughs> as well. And that's the stuff to navigate. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> This final question over there. Hi. Um, so I'm really interested in your Darwin story project. Yep. I like how you combine all the new technologies. Um, we're actually this, um, we are doing something really similar. Oh, great. So you can come grab it to my garage. <laughs> 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 um, so, yeah, I'm just wondering what are the most important touch points in terms of user interaction with those two types of technologies and what did you find most challenging? Um, it's all quite challenging. Um, I don't know. It's kind of like I was saying before. What what really surprised? I mean, are you working with a phone? Is that yeah? It? yeah. Uh, that the wonderful thing about it is, like I was saying, is that you don't have to tell anyone how to use it at all, mm. unless it's a rotary phone where very <laughs> young people might get very confused. Um, what were some of the challenges? Um, I mean, a nice thing that we built into it as well that we had to turn off when it was in libraries, but if it doesn't get enough attention, it starts ringing <laughs> as well, which is good. Um, so, was, yeah, I think the threshold was set at 20 minutes, I think, if it hadn't been activated, then it's, uh, it's like John's our friend screaming at you. Um, what else we learned? Yeah, I think um, if you're interested in people providing content as well down the phone, that giving, giving them enough kind of intimacy and enough space to do that is really important. Um, you can, uh, so we, the, the handset that we had on that was actually an old Telstra handset, which happened to be the exact same color as the Penguin branding, which is exciting. Um, the sound was terrible, so we actually had to retrofit that with a decent speaker. And when you do that, then that opens up a whole bunch of sound design and composition stuff that you can't do with a normal phone, which is surprising for people as well, to hear that kind of fidelity of sound coming out of a crappy old phone. Um, that's probably it, I think. That was actually that was a really smooth pr project that kind of was, was very successful and um, yeah, beyond the, the first kind of putting it in a really public place and then kind of moving it away. The moderation was really important in that as well, so I was getting some shockers coming through of people saying all sorts of terrible stuff. But then, you know, giving people that agency, I had this one a guy, it was an old, older guy who was told this saga of meeting his wife and they you know, met by chance in Belgium and then the war happened and then there's something in the end and they were in London and it all worked out in the end and then he said, and she's standing in front of me right now. It's like, you can't write that stuff. And so yeah, so it's a, it's a good tool to kind of give people the freedom to kind of contribute that stuff. We'll end on that very lovely note. <laughs> if everyone would like to thank Dan again. For